In the beginning, there were wheels and there were chairs. The first known wheel appears in ancient Sumeria in 3500 BC, whilst the chair as furniture is first recorded in Egyptian reliefs. Lighter spoked wheels seem to have originated in Asia Minor, but soon spread across the ancient world. The notion of adding wheels to furniture is credited to ancient Greece with a movable child's bed. But it's in a 5th century Chinese engraving that we first see the concept of a wheeled chair. Although it's another thousand years before we see a wheelchair as we might recognise it today. An infirm King Philip II of Spain had an elaborate rolling chair with adjustable back and footrests. The first recorded example of a wheelchair for someone with a specific disability was in 1655, when German watchmaker Stefan Fafler became paraplegic. He designed his own self-propelled chair, a wheeled box with hand cranks. But special bespoke chairs were generally the preserve of the wealthy, such as Louis XIV of France, the Sun King, who used a wheelchair known as a roulette whilst recovering from a secret and painful operation. Wheeled chairs for the masses came in 18th century England, where James Heath developed the bath chair. Large rear wheels were combined with a small steerable wheel on a long arm, so it could be pushed by hand or hooked up to a pony and be towed. Bath chairs became a common sight on the streets of Victorian Britain, providing mobility for many people who would otherwise be immobile. Wars have provided society with many disabled people. They increase need and so drive innovation. The first mass-produced indoor wheelchair came in post-Civil War America, where a patent was granted for a lightweight wicker chair with rubber tyres and push rims. Whilst the first electrically powered chair appeared midway through the First World War in 1916. But it wasn't until the 1930s that the first modern type folding wheelchairs appeared. Designed by Harold Jennings, whose company, Everest and Jennings, went on to add an electric motor battery and joystick to create the first mass-market powered chair in 1956. In recent years, wheelchair development has increased rapidly, reflecting the needs, rights and increasing aspirations of disabled people. There are manual chairs that are highly adjustable, manual chairs that are custom fitted, manual off-road chairs, hand cycle chairs and children's chairs. There are numerous add-on enhancements, various ancillary support options, clip-on powered units or supplementary powered wheels. There is also a wide range of chairs enabling participation in sports and other leisure activities. Then there are numerous powered chair designs with a wide range of sizes and capabilities with different control systems, support and cushioning systems including chairs that lift and those that help users to stand. Even chairs that can take the user off-road and into pretty extreme environments. There's also a myriad of transportation options and adapted vehicles because the wheelchair itself is only part of a person's overall journey. But whilst greater choice is generally considered good news, it can make arriving at the right solution more difficult. This film has been created to help make sense of it all. If the person who needs a wheelchair uh, gets the appropriate wheelchair, it will enable them to lead a life to the maximum potential that they have, the functional potential. If it's not right, uh, it means that they can run into all sorts of problems, both in terms of tissue problems, in terms of posture, psychological well-being, and of course, lack of function. If you don't have the right wheelchair, you're not going to be able to function to your maximum ability. And a lot of the people that I deal with have, uh, got, have a limited remaining ability to function. Getting the seat right and the chair right for the client 
can make all the difference. It can give them health benefits, they might be able to breathe better, sit for longer periods of time, have appropriate pressure relief, and they'll be able to get out and about and enjoy life and not be restricted by the limitations imposed upon them by inappropriate equipment provision. Wheelchair provision is a very complex mechanism and one should not underestimate that. We need all to learn more about uh, all the implications and learn to work together as a team. It's important to have a holistic approach to wheelchair assessment because you need to look at the whole picture. Uh, it's not just um, a, a mechanical outcome. So depending on the individual's needs, several different professions may need to get involved. The optimal uh, assessment uh, protocol should start with a clinical assessment of the patient with the uh, interview of the patient and clinical examination, as well as uh, defining the treatment protocol. The medical assessment is uh, the fundamental, really, because you need to have the diagnosis and the prognosis. You would also need to know whether there are any underlying medical conditions that you have to take into consideration. With regards to the diagnosis, it's essential to establish whether it's a stable condition or an evolving condition. In all cases, the assessment process is, is critical to the provision of any wheelchair, whether it's for the person who is just going to be a casual user or to the person who, as with the people that I'm dealing with, the more severe conditions. Uh, it has to be comprehensive and that's the fundamental point. For an appropriate assessment of somebody who needs a wheelchair, I think it's very important that first of all the individual is listened to in terms of trying to identify what it is exactly that they want to be able to do with the wheelchair. And that's very different from person to person. Uh, it depends on their lifestyle, where they're going to use it, exactly who's going to use it. Are they the only ones using or are they going to have assistance from somebody else? Um, that will influence the type of chair you're looking at and the type of configuration of the chair. Then there's the physical assessment of the individual and here it's really important to be able to identify if there are any skin issues or if there's any postural issues that are outside of what we would call normal posture. It's totally impossible to assess those aspects unless you get your hands on the individual and have a look at the person in their habitual posture and also where gravity is eliminated as in a, in a lying down position. To do a proper physical assessment usually you would have to have the person undressed so that you can actually see what the skin is telling you. Skin folds can actually tell you about uh, pressures on, on the posture. Uh, if they're tending to lean to one side or the other. So there's lots of clues to be picked up that you learn with experience uh, to use and then feed back into your conclusion on the assessment. In the majority of cases, the first step when choosing a wheelchair should be a clinical assessment of your medical situation and needs. Your physician will discuss your condition and, depending on your care plan, make the appropriate referrals. I have a spinal cord injury and I cannot walk very well. I can walk around the house, but I can't walk outside. Uh, I can't go very far and my balance is not terribly good. And I find I spend a lot of time indoors just looking at trees from behind a window as opposed to being able to um, go and sit under a tree and for that reason, I, I need a wheelchair. Sarita has a C4 incomplete spinal cord injury and was referred to me by her GP. During the course of the consultation, I discovered that she had problems with her wheelchair and uh, I've had given her some advice on what to look for to have the optimum wheelchair and how to avoid having complications. The next step for Sarita is to contact her spinal centre so as to be able to seek advice from them on how to choose a wheelchair. They in turn will contact the wheelchair services. Hopefully initiatives like this one will improve the collaboration between treating clinicians and their wheelchair services. For Sarita, a better chair would um, 
allow her to be more independent, to improve the quality of her life, to reduce the incidence of pain and of spasticity, of discomfort in the present chair. I'm a great optimist. I'm sure somewhere out there in the big wide world, there is a chair for me that will suit me. I will find it or it will find me. Being motivated to get the right wheelchair is important. Whether it's for you or someone in your care, the right chair selection can dramatically improve the user's quality of life. I'm 50 years old. I'm married to Janet. I have four children. I live in Northumberland, which is Hadrian Wall country. I love that. I run an access management consultancy and my favourite pastimes are walking the dog, sampling single cask malt whiskies, and driving my amazing monster motor trike. I got involved in wheelchair racing because at the time I was doing a lot of outdoor activities and then I got into delivery of the sport itself. The first wheelchair that I was given was in hospital, the old American style 1950s, folding, heavy, cumbersome, difficult to manoeuvre. I, I quickly realised that I needed something a bit more lightweight, a bit more manoeuvrable, something more tapered to myself. So I was kind of self-learnt what I thought I needed, but I went to a very reputable dealership who had salespeople who were wheelchair users who knew what they were talking about. And that's when I got a bit more enlightenment and I got to understand technically how the chair related to my needs. If you are just wheeling through the streets or going up a hill, isn't it great if your chair's lighter? Isn't it easier if you can get a better power transfer and there's less wear and tear on your body? Isn't it good if you can get closer to something to make a transfer? So for example, I'm sitting in a chair which is made from titanium. It's got carbon fibre elements to it. If I'm cruising down the road and I swing my hips, the chair will change direction. If I go back to the 80s when I first used my old heavy chairs, it, the, the energy you needed, the force just to lift the front wheels off the ground, were incredible. Now the chairs are more and more fitted to the body. So if you're independent and you've got your upper body strength, um, you tend to find that type of person is using chairs where we've stolen that technology from sport. For me, to be able to not have to strain to move my chair, for it not to damage my body, which if I had a standard chair which isn't fitted to me, it would do. It makes my life a lot easier. I can participate in a lot more things. I'm healthier, happier, and I don't end up costing the system or the taxpayer money. If we continue giving people chairs that aren't right, they're going to suffer, but so will everybody else. Hi, John. Yeah. I've got that drawing. That I've if we can get someone into the right chair, then actually it's going to be cheaper in the long run. Many long-term wheelchair users may not have benefited from a proper assessment process. A physician's referral could involve a wheelchair services clinic, a physiotherapist, an occupational therapist, or someone with expertise in seating, posture management and pressure relief. I had a car crash when I was two. I wasn't wearing a seat belt. I hit my head on the dashboard of the car and sustained a spinal injury. The chair that I've got at the moment I mean, is reaching the end of its lifespan and needs to be replaced. When somebody comes into clinic for an assessment, it's important to take the time not just to get the personal details, but while you're spending time doing that, it allows you to just observe the individual and notice any particular body language that they might have. It also relaxes the person because often when they know they're going to be assessed for their posture, they will try to sit in the way that they think you want them to sit. What I'm looking for in the assessment is to identify anything that's outside of the normal symmetrical posture and particularly to establish whether that abnormality is flexible, i.e. correctable, or whether it's actually fixed, because that will tell me what scope I have for intervention. I tend to start at the pelvis, because the pelvis will determine how the rest of the body will actually align itself. I will also make sure that I sit square in front of the individual so that I have a clear view and also explain to the individual what I'm going to do next so that nothing comes as a surprise to them. 
One of the things I noticed with Danny when I carried out the examination in the chair was that his feet didn't seem to rest fully on the footplate. So I decided to take the shoes off to have a closer look at his feet. He showed some degree of spasticity in his legs, but this actually relaxed and showed that he actually has got full range of movement in his ankles. Also in the chair assessment, it's important to look at the individual from the side and then finally also from the back. Each aspect will reveal different clues to what the problems may be and help as parts of the puzzle that actually makes up the whole clinical assessment for posture. In most situations, it would be essential to undress the individual because just being able to look at the skin would actually in itself give you a lot of information. Skin folds uh, can be an indication of how the body tends to sit or, or how the body tends to be placed um, during the day. With Danny, uh, it was apparent that he had a slight curvature of his lumbar spine, which did correct when he laid down. It also corrected when he actually lifted up in his wheelchair. This is a very simple way of assessing whether something will just drop out when the weight is taken off. One particularly important part of the assessment on the plinth is to make sure that the hip range is examined where the pelvis is fixed and the hip is then put into flexion. This actually gives the clinician the exact angle that is available for the chair configuration. Once the hip angle has been established, it's a good position to then test how far the knee can extend because this will determine the angle of the lower leg when sitting in the chair. Pressure mapping is a relatively new tool for us in the seating clinic. It's an incredibly valuable tool, but it also needs to be used with caution. It basically maps the pressure between the individual and the seating surface that they're sitting on and gives a very graphic visual display that the individual can actually look at during the assessment. It is beneficial when you're trying to compare one cushion with another. It's also a very valuable feedback tool when you're trying to teach people about pressure relief because it demonstrates very, very clearly how just small postural changes will actually shift the pressure away from those very vulnerable bony points that tend to be the areas that break down. Pressure mapping is a very useful adjunct to a good clinical assessment and very helpful in identifying uh, appropriate cushions, but it's also a very, very useful feedback tool for the people that are being assessed. Pressure mapping should be used quite cautiously. It shouldn't be used on its own to actually prescribe a seating intervention. Often people that are quite disabled feel that they can't influence their pressure relief, but actually by showing just the shift of a head or a slight lean to one side will actually be sufficient to change the pressures sufficiently to relieve the pressure over the vulnerable bony points. If I was giving someone advice as to how best to choose a chair, well, they should speak to their healthcare professionals. There's a number of very experienced charities out there that can offer great advice. Uh, and also make sure that they go to uh, authorised wheelchair dealers that are experienced and come under the British Healthcare Trade Association. I need a wheelchair because I had a spinal injury in 1974, complete lesion T9, permanent wheelchair user. John came to the clinic to have a review of his seating but was particularly concerned about his posture. His posture is compromised because of the original fractures that he sustained to his pelvis and also to his leg subsequently. This has resulted in him having different leg lengths, which will influence the type of cushion that he can use, but it has also influenced the way that his pelvis is actually allowing him to sit. To have an assessment as an ongoing part of your therapy is a very good idea because you can sometimes find that they're telling you things that you haven't quite noticed yourself. That's excellent. Good. With John, it became apparent that his pelvis was not level and it wasn't actually possible to correct this. Therefore, the cushion that John needs will need to accommodate that fixed pelvic posture rather than try to correct it. 
The main cushion types that we have to work with are basically foam cushions, gel or liquid cushions or air cushions or actually combinations of those materials. If a cushion is going to correct a posture, we need to have a right-left division in the cushion to be able to stabilize the pelvis. This could be done either by having different sections in it or it could have different sections that could be filled with more material as, for instance, is evident in an air cushion. I think you should make the most of the periodic assessments if you're offered them, because as time goes by, technology changes, your own personal needs can change, and maybe your body shape, perhaps you're not quite as mobile as you were. Knowing what else is out there can be very, very useful. Something quite simple change can make such a massive impact. When choosing a wheelchair, you need to consider what mode of transport you're likely to use the most. I drive a great deal, in which case I'm in and out of my car several times each day, and having a lightweight wheelchair that fits me and be able to get it in and out very quickly and with a minimum of fuss is of paramount use for my own needs. It's important to take your time when you're picking a wheelchair because there's lots of considerations that you need to take that may change as time goes by. So having a chair that you can make certain adjustments on in the early days would be very much to your benefit before you look a little bit more long term and perhaps choose a chair that's a little bit more fixed to your own needs. For those needing a wheelchair who have more profound disability, there are specialists with expertise in high dependency cases where the correct chair and seating is particularly important. The assessment process is fundamental to prescription and uh, particularly for the more severe cases it has to be full and comprehensive. I usually divide it into five components, the medical, the physical, the environmental, the social and the psychological. So we're going to cover all of those aspects of that person's lifestyle. Tim is a young man of 27 years old whom I first met six years ago and I've seen him recently for review. He has very limited movement. He has some movement in his head, a little bit of movement in his left arm and a tiny bit of movement in his left leg. He understands clearly what's spoken to him, but he has no verbal communication himself. The assessment process is quite a lengthy affair with these more uh, severe and complex disability um, because there are a lot of areas to cover. And what I usually start with is an interview so that we cover all the aspects of that individual's lifestyle. And then I start from looking at the individual in the wheelchair. Now, I've been looking at him while I've been doing the interview, but now, at this stage of the game, I want to get my hands on to actually find out exactly what the body shape is, starting with the pelvis, and then look at the relationship of each body segment relative to the pelvis. Then I will take him out of the wheelchair and put him onto the bed. When Tim has been transferred onto the plinth, I let him rest so that he can take up his usual body shape. And that gives me the opportunity to look at his seat, because the seat will tell me where the areas of pressure have been, where the wear is actually in the seat. Now my next bit is to observe that body shape to see if it's similar to the one in the wheelchair. And then I will analyse that body shape in the same way that I have done it in the wheelchair, looking at the bending and the rotation of one body segment relative to another, starting with the pelvis. In Tim's case, I'm very pleased to say that the wheelchair corresponds to his particular body shape, and because of that, it's supporting him well. He's not in danger of getting any pressure sores, and it allows him to function to the best of his ability and to do what he likes to do, particularly music and DJing, which he loves so much.
Achieving the correct seating solution, with postural support and appropriate pressure relief, benefits the majority of chair users. For some high-dependency individuals, a custom-fitted seat is essential. The way we capture the individual's body shape is using bead bags full of polystyrene beads um, with a little vacuum seal at the end through which we can attach a pump and suck the air out. Once we've taken the mould, we've got a couple of different processes that we follow depending on what material we're going to make the seat from. The three different materials we use are foam, which we make um, from different densities depending on how much support is needed, matrix. Matrix is a sheet of interconnecting clamping joints based on a ball and socket and you can shape it around any form and clamp it off and thermoplastic that we often use for lightweight systems because it's taking a sheet of plastic, heating it and forming it over the plaster tool. For a foam seat we have a four axis profiling machine rather like key cutting. So we trace around the mould on one side whilst the cutter is following every movement we make on the other and that cuts through foam in successive layers. What I'd really like to see in the future for wheelchair provision is that needs, the individual's needs stay central to the approach and all the professionals and suppliers involved in that process look to meet those needs. Whatever the nature of someone's disability, proper wheelchair provision is all about helping an individual to live life to the fullest and to achieve their maximum potential. I had bikes all my life. I raced from when I was six years old up to 18 when I crashed and was paralysed. I first got into wheelchair racing by seeing a YouTube clip progress from there of getting my own, getting into pushing and then into the racing. <laughs> Key differences between my racing wheelchair and my day-to-day -day wheelchair. Obviously the, the physical size of, a, of the racing wheelchair it has three wheels, a 20 inch front wheel and two 28 inch back wheels. The preparation that I do before a road session is just check on my chair, the tyre pressures, make sure the tyres are fully inflated, check over the chair, make sure nothing is loose. The features that are important in a good racing chair is, the, well the most important feature is it's to fit you right. You want no no sort of sloppiness in, in the racing chair so all the forward movement that you do goes through the wheels and it doesn't move your body in the chair. In a racing wheelchair it's got to be really snug. I mean your day chair hasn't to be as snug but it's got to be snug enough so it offers you the most um, support um, and then obviously the sort of the lightweight materials that come through a racing wheelchair that sort of stem down into day-to-day -day chairs to make the chair easy to push. The advice I would give to a chair user that's wanting to get into racing or just to physically do it to keep fit is um, just sort of take your time into it. There's a lot of technique involved in, in pushing a racing chair, so you have to kind of get disheartened at first when you can't get the technique right. And don't just look at the top elite athletes who make it look easy. Racing's been a, a big impact on the rest of my life, mainly for confidence. Obviously with racing, I have to put a lot of effort into training and keeping physically fit. I think feeling fit gives you a good sort of mental boost as well and it makes you feel confident and then that transfers across into everyday life. Once you get into sports or you find a little goal that you have in life, maybe it doesn't even have to be a sport, just a, a hobby or a, a work really, just something you start to forget about all the little things that you can't do and you get used to who you are. For many wheelchair users, self-propulsion or attendant propulsion doesn't suit their circumstances. In this instance, a power chair or power-assisted manual chair may be a better solution. Add-on power-assist units such as powered wheels or clip-on powered units bridge the gap between manual and powered chairs. They can help manual users to travel further or to manage hills. Some of these systems are intelligent they sense how much extra propulsion or braking to apply. 
full-blown powered chairs come in a wide range of types, from powerful bariatric chairs for large people to highly adaptable chairs for optimum support and comfort. There are small footprint chairs for enhanced manoeuvrability in tight spaces, and even scooters for those who can walk, but maybe not very far. The advantages of powered chairs include effortless propulsion. Powered chairs can also generally take more seating and control options, both of which are good features for those with more severe impairment. Powered chairs do have disadvantages. They tend to be larger and heavier. They're also typically more expensive to buy and to maintain, with extra bulk making them more difficult to transport. Powered chairs can also generally accept a wider range of accessories, such as control options for the feet, hands and mouth, with tremendous levels of adaptability for those with limited movement and imprecise function. Given the bewildering array of powered chair options, it's important to seek the advice of an experienced chair expert. I'm a manual wheelchair user. I'm a senior consultant for a manufacturer of wheelchairs and I travel a lot all over the country working with uh, occupational therapists, doing assessments. I also attend trade shows and speak to clients and I also uh, do training for dealerships on seating and positioning and on power chairs. You have power chairs in three parts. You have the base, then you have your seating and then you have your electrical options. Power chair may be the best option for a client when the client is either old and they can't manually propel themselves anymore or for different disabilities which require a power base rather than a manual base. A medical assessment is fundamental to a patient's well-being when assessing for a wheelchair. You can't just go into a shop and expect to see a power chair which fits you. You have to be assessed for that chair, measured for that chair correctly and that would involve possibly an occupational therapist as well as a specialist like myself who would do a proper assessment out at your home and in your environment where you're going to use the power chair. Uh, it's very important that you realise that you can't just buy a chair, they are made to measure. There are similarities between power chairs and manual chairs. Both chairs require the correct seating and the correct uh, pressure relief in the cushions and they've got to fit into your life whether it's for work or whether it's going out around the town it, that chair has got to be correct for you. When you're choosing a power chair it's important that you look for the next five years on your condition. Is your condition going to change whether that be clinically changed or your lifestyle is going to change within that five years. Don't be pushed into getting the first power chair you see. Take your time and look at all different chairs and getting chairs brought out to your environment where you're going to use the chair. As the benefits of getting it right are enormous. Whilst most wheelchairs are suitable for urban environments, there are various ruggedized designs that enable chair users to access terrain that is otherwise inaccessible. I have spina bifida, so I've been unable to walk all my life. I've had to use a wheelchair from a very early age. The idea of an all-terrain wheelchair to me is excellent. The first thing I'm going to do is to give Karen a guided tour of the chair, beginning with the wheels, the suspension, the seating, the controls, and the restraints. The purpose of an all-terrain wheelchair is to enable the user to go over sand, gravel, rocks, stones, grass, mud, to the beach, basically to places they were unable to go to previously. This particular design has a side roll bar which opens up to allow access. It also gives further rigidity. Transferring into the chair was actually quite easy. It was much easier than it looked. I was a little cautious when I first sat in the chair, however I did soon get used to it. I had a feeling of great delight when I drove the chair across the ground for the very first time. Carol was quite tentative at first, but after a short time she became very confident and realised how useful an all-terrain wheelchair would be for her. Typically, you'd find on an off-road chair larger wheels, 
you'd also find that they are wider, which gives stability. You'd have suspension, which enables the product to function over undulating terrain. The suspension also makes it more comfortable for the user. There are also manually propelled all-terrain wheelchairs. Well, they do require the user to have upper body strength and fitness, so they are not suitable for everyone. Later on, we went on to a new location where we did quite a bit of extreme stuff, where Karen found it quite fun. The thing that really struck me about the chair initially was the robustness um, of the chair, the chassis itself and the knobbly tyres. Having used all sorts of different sports wheelchairs in the past um, and have been involved in different sports at quite a high level, I was quite keen to test the chair to its fullest potential. And I was able to do that quite a lot in the river. I have to say that this chair gave me the opportunity to experience places that I had never ever been able to experience in my whole entire life. When choosing a wheelchair, one should consider all areas of likely usage, including transport. For manual wheelchair users who wish to use a car and who are able to transfer out of their wheelchair, it is safer to transfer onto the vehicle's original factory-fitted seat and to use the car's existing seat belt. The manual wheelchair can then be stowed as an item of luggage by folding or disassembling. If a person needs to travel sitting in their own wheelchair, then a larger wheelchair-adapted vehicle may be the best option. In this case, certain standards apply and the wheelchair should meet certain criteria as laid out in ISO 7176 Part 19. New technology floor plate locking systems can add convenience to wheelchair restraint in adapted vehicles by offering a simple drive-on and lock mechanism. The chair occupant will still need to use a seat belt and not all wheelchairs can be adapted for this type of restraint so one should check with the manufacturer. Information about a chair's suitability for use in transport, including any limitations in use, can be found in the manufacturer's instructions. Because there's a lot at stake safety-wise, it's important to seek expert advice before purchasing a wheelchair in which to travel. A suitable chair will have tie-down points at the front and rear. It should facilitate the positioning of a seat belt low on the pelvis without having to remove components such as skirt guards. The chair's seat back should be high enough to provide proper support when on the move, and further head support may be necessary. The weight of the wheelchair should be known so that the correct tie-down system can be selected. If wheelchair access is via a passenger lift, then the lift must be able to take the combined weight of the wheelchair and the user. If wheelchair access is via a ramp, then the chair must be stable when going up and down the ramp. Backpacks and chairs attached to a chair's push handles will affect wheelchair stability. They are best removed. A good quality supplier will look specifically at every aspect of the person's needs and give impartial advice, build a long-term relationship to get the solution right Morning, every Sharon. time. This is the third vehicle we've supplied to David and Sharon for their daughter Katie. Katie had a road traffic accident in 2002 uh, she was run over. She'd got an acquired brain injury, uh, which has left her uh, quadriplegic. Um, so she needs a wheelchair that is fully supportive. We also have on there a lucky headrest, which holds Katie's head up because she doesn't have head control. To get her out and about uh, in a vehicle, uh, which is adapted as, as a must. A key element of the vehicle is, is the lift. Uh, we want something that's reliable, easy to use, packs away neatly. Uh, so that it's not looking too uh, industrial. Uh, it, it's just got to be something that you wouldn't notice. Inconspicuous, I think, is the word. A lift is deployed on a button and will drop down to the floor, allowing the wheelchair user to get onto the lift, be raised up automatically and be able to get into the vehicle. I think for having the right vehicle, um, you feel safe and you feel you can go anywhere you want and she has got the right restraints in there. We looked at the suspension in a car because she's got no upper body support. We didn't want to be a jiggled about in a wheelchair. So there's lots of things to look at. You've got to realistically look 
at what you can get and get the best you can get within your budget. The advice I would offer to anyone looking at a wheelchair accessible vehicle would be to take your time and choose based on what feels right for your circumstances. We wanted Katie to be part of the family. We wanted her to be included in everything that was being done. She could see out the windows. She had someone sitting next to her as opposed to being segregated into the back of the vehicle. And uh, we just wanted her to enjoy the journey. Just because you're disabled doesn't mean that you can't go out and fall in love with the car. The cars we picked in the end, I think, are right for Kate and, and to make it comfortable and an enjoyable journey for her every time she goes out. Adapted vehicles are liberating for those whose lives would otherwise be limited to their own immediate surroundings, but they can be costly and are not for everyone. Access to public transport is improving, plus there are community services that offer access to transport at low cost or no cost. Here, wheelchair restraint is a key safety issue. The main pitfalls associated with wheelchair restraints are that drivers think that one system will fit all, we have to develop different types of restraints to fit the many different designs and weights of wheelchairs. Uh, we recommend wherever possible to carry out a risk assessment of the wheelchair and the occupant before transporting. On our website we have something called a wheelchair guide which um, a transport provider can actually access the wheelchair guide and find the manufacturer, the make of wheelchair and then we'll recommend the correct type of restraint for that wheelchair. Driving the bus, which is a very small part of the actual job, uh, passenger safety and well-being is uh, the paramount uh, issue. Today I'm transporting Wendy, who's a lady I've known for many years, uh, uh, know quite well, and uh, she's today uh, using a power wheelchair. It's important to use the correct restraints because there's over 500 different types of wheelchair currently on the market, ranging from manual wheelchairs up to very heavy powered wheelchairs. So it's important that you get the right product for the right wheelchair. People can recognise a good wheelchair restraint by ensuring that the manufacturer has fitted a label which states that the product complies with a recognised industry standard, which is ISO 10542. Once the power chair is in position, uh, located over the rails, we take two front straps. In this case today I'll be showing Colin static front straps with a carabiner hook. We attach them to, into the rail and then place them onto the wheelchair and then just applying the power we move the wheelchair back which tensions the front straps. We come round to the back of the chair, apply the brakes on the powered wheelchair and then we take hold of the rear straps and these are the ones that are adjustable. We connect them into the floor, attach them onto the wheelchair and use an over centre buckle to then put tension onto the back straps. Then it's always important that we remember to put an occupant restraint on the client as well. The legal obligations for a driver fitting restraints comes under the Road Traffic Act of 1988. Uh, this act states that a person is guilty of an offence if um, he or she uses a vehicle, its accessories or the equipment in the vehicle which can cause danger of injury to any person being transported in that vehicle. Well, restraints uh, contribute to passenger safety uh, in that they are a vital part of what we do and it's essential to have the right restraints for the right chairs. Whilst maintaining a professional relationship with the client, you do develop a friendship with, with some of the ones who you see on a regular basis. You, I've known some of my clients for many years now and uh, we get along very well. Um, I always try to be helpful and friendly whether, I, whether they're, they're new to me or whether they're old friends, if you like. When a wheelchair user's circumstances change and a new chair is warranted, its impact on the other aspects of a person's life should be considered carefully, especially when the transition is from a manual to a powered chair. After 40 years of uh, being in a wheelchair, I found that the upper arm strength uh, was depleting and I was starting to have serious problems with pushing myself around. What I had to do was go and see a, a consultant and after three or four visits, he recommended that I should go into a power chair. But then we had a, a, a bit of a problem because we couldn't figure out how to put the, 
this power chair into an estate car. We thought no more about it because I was still using my other chair for going in and out of the Nissan Primera I had. We came back off holiday and when we got back to the, the car at the airport I noticed that the hand controls were sticking. On the following day I uh, arranged with a company to have them fixed. While I was there, there was a VW transporter. It had uh, all the things which a paraplegic could possibly wish for. I asked the, the, the boss of the company if he knew anywhere where I could maybe buy one second hand because I thought, well, the cost of a new one would be far excessive to, to what I could afford. He just happened to mention that there was a, a company down in Bromborough who might be able to help me. So after making a phone call to this company, we were invited to come down and, and have a chat and a look around the workshops. I think we talked to a man called Christian, who kindly let me drive a demo van. He, he said to me, well, I think the type of vehicle that you require and the type of power chair that you have, the VW transporter, would be the ideal vehicle. But then we, we started talking about cost and that. He says, well, why don't you try and ask for a grant off Motability? I never thought that you could have a grant to get a vehicle adapted. We applied for a grant, which took a matter of maybe a month, and the grant was accepted. The company uh, was contacted by Motability, and they supplied me with a, a, a brand new vehicle. I was very excited, and... The thought of being now totally independent and not having to rely on my wife, having to put the chair in the boot of the car, that, that was now history. The first time I went out was today. I thought, well, I'll go up to the cafe in Hoylake where I do some uh, voluntary work. Going down the motorway, I thought, this is quite exciting, this, <laughs> being on my own. And uh, the surprise on the cafe owner's face when I went in and I was on my own. He, he was very pleased to, to, to think that I'd made the journey. So with that, I had a big sausage butty and a, a nice cup of coffee and uh, really enjoyed it. In the UK, Many who may need a wheelchair will be referred to their local wheelchair services, part of the NHS. Wheelchair Services has centres of excellence, with dedicated first-class practitioners. But provision is not yet consistent, so those clients who are better informed, who can be more proactive and ask the right questions, are likely to get the best outcome. In addition to NHS provision, there are also experienced independent dealers who can offer good advice. Unfortunately, there are also brown box sellers for whom wheelchairs are just another commodity to ship out. They are best avoided. Although different chair users may have dramatically different needs, the core principles of good wheelchair assessment are a useful starting point. A good practitioner will encourage a client to express their needs and aspirations. They will discuss the user's lifestyle and personal situation and take into account their medical, physical and psychological needs. They will carefully consider issues relating to posture and pressure relief and will involve other experts when appropriate. Good practitioners will examine carefully the client's domestic, work, leisure and transportation needs and give consideration to the various locations where the chair will be used. Good practitioners will also establish who else may need to manage the chair, such as a carer. They will also consider any likely changes in the chair user's condition over time. Good practitioners will not be in a hurry. They will know that getting things right is the key to success and that extra effort benefits everyone in the long term. The available budget, whether it's fully NHS funded, funded in part with an NHS voucher, a private purchase or a combination of sources is always a key issue and can be a worry. Because some wheelchairs represent a substantial investment, it means that making the right choice is all the more important. Also, when considering cost, chair maintenance and insurance should be borne in mind. Cheap solutions, whilst initially attractive, can represent false economy. A more personalised chair solution is likely to perform better for longer, 
be more reliable and enhance the user's life and capabilities. It is also more likely to minimise the instances of painful, avoidable and expensive long-term complications. The optimum solution benefits society as a whole by reducing the often considerable costs that can result from poor provision, a fact that tends to be lost when the focus is on the initial ticket price only. People whose needs or desires are not fully met by state provision need not get too disheartened. Good providers may know of potential sources of additional funding. There are grants, workplace or sports club support, local fundraising groups, national charities and NGOs. It's not a perfect situation by any means, but thanks to the internet, access to sources of additional support has never been easier. Organisations that help those with specific conditions have social media pages where one can visit, post questions, talk to advisors, follow further links and share experiences with others. Once you have a new wheelchair, using it correctly is important. Good technique will help manual chair users to preserve upper limb function. Several organisations run training courses. Everyone who's contributed to this film has done so freely to help improve the outcomes for those requiring a wheelchair, to help people to be more mobile and to live more liberated lives. We thank our volunteer experts and participating chair users for their time and considerable efforts. If this film has been useful to you, please consider making a donation to help fund its ongoing availability. We all hope that in future the route to choosing a wheelchair will be a little bit easier.